when I was praying about what message to bring here to this conference, and the conference is on prayer. The conference talks about, I've heard many great messages, and I've said, Lord, I want to find the direction, the vein in which you want me to minister. And so the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about the four realms of prayer. Now, don't get freaked out when I say four realms of prayer. I don't mean four dimensions. I'm talking about four different realities, four different categories, four different expressions of prayer. But no matter where you are in your prayer life, whether you're a new convert or whether you're experienced, whether you've learned the subtleties of prayer, whether you've not come to be familiar with the nuances of spiritual warfare and worship and how all of these dynamics work together, the interaction between spirit to spirit, your voice to God's ears, God's voice to your ears, whether or not you're very familiar or whether or not you're completely clueless and you have to say, Jesus, teach me to pray because I don't know a word I'm saying, It is the Holy Spirit who enables prayer. Let me tell you something. Not only can you not pray without the power of the Holy Spirit, you couldn't even desire to pray without the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of discipline, though that's part of it. It's not a matter of the will, though that's part of it. It's not a matter of emotion, though that can be affected by prayer. It is by the Holy Spirit that we are led into the depths of the presence of God. It is by the Holy Spirit that we are led to the place we are granted audience with our Father. Prayer is by the Spirit. You cannot enter the Spirit in the flesh. You cannot enter the Spirit by will or aggression. When I first began to pray, I was 11 years old, and I remember the Holy Spirit just beginning to deal with my heart, and He began to speak to me about dedicating myself more to prayer, dedicating my heart more to Him. And what happened was interesting. It was a very, you know what I'm talking about, those very sweet seasons in your life, and there's just, that's the word I used to describe it. There's just a sweetness to the presence that abides on your prayer life during certain seasons. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so I remember I had come to one of those seasons when I was 11 years old. And I, like many of you, came to God with somewhat of an ultimatum. And I was desperate. I was hungry. I was passionate. I said, Lord, I want to know Jesus more. Father, I want to step into everything that you have for me. And I remember coming into my room. I closed my door. I locked it. I stepped into the room and I said, Jesus, I am not leaving this place until I have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Because I had heard that the Holy Spirit could be my friend, and that notion intrigued me. I used to think that it was somewhat of a a spiritual misdemeanor to talk to the Holy Spirit, or misdemeanor idolatry to pray to the Holy Spirit instead of Jesus. I used to wonder, Jesus, do you get offended when I address the Holy Spirit? And for that matter, why do they call Him the Holy Spirit? If He's a person. But I reconcile that because we call Him the Father, the Son. The Holy Spirit. The has nothing to do with it. All I knew is that I wanted to connect to this reality, this spiritual helper, this advocate, this comforter, this one who would come alongside me and assist me into the depths of the Spirit. And I wanted to know that one. And I said, Holy Spirit, I want to know you, and I'm not leaving this room until you touch my life, until I experience the overwhelming presence until I experience the manifested glory of the sun right here in my room. I said, Lord, I want my room to become a little piece of heaven on earth. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to leave here. And I remember I started my prayer with emotion. I reached for every melancholy emotion you can imagine. There was frustration. I even did that whole thing where I said, Lord, Are you ignoring me? God, do you hear me? You know, we're trying to guilt God into a response. As if he can be manipulated. God, don't you hear me? But I often use this analogy. Using emotion to pray or to try to find that place of prayer is like yelling at someone on the cell phone when there's a bad connection. The issue is not the volume. The issue is the connection with the network. So you can yell. You can scream. Power is not noise. I worked myself into frenzy, and I said, Lord, I want to touch you. I want to know you. I want to see your face. I want your glory to descend in this place, and I began to reach for all those emotions, and I'm pulling on all those emotions, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. One hour had passed, and nothing happened. I said, okay, 
That didn't work. And then I reached for my aggressive side. I thought, if I, if I can't cry my way in, I'll declare, I'll decree, I'll rebuke demons my way into the presence of God. I started rebuking and imagining demons in every corner. You get out of here, you spirit of this and you spirit of that. Every adjective I could think of, I attached it to a demonic being and rebuked it. And I got aggressive and I got angry and I got stirred. I remember I used to attend prayer class, which really helped me. And I reached for every prayer technique, every prayer formula, every strategy. I started to think back, okay, was it something when I was seven? But you know, all of these things that go through your mind, what's blocking this? And I thought, what is going on? And I reached for that aggression and I began to try to pummel my way through that wall that seemed to be obstructing my one swift spiritual movement. And I tried to Break through that wall with aggression. And I stand before you, God's honest truth. One more hour passed and nothing happened. I said, okay. I'm going to try to be persistent. Jesus talked about persistence in Matthew 7. And I said, Lord... I'm going to use my will. I'm going to use my persistence. I'm going to use my faithfulness. And I stood there just praying. I couldn't even tell you what I was praying. And I tried to say, Lord, here I am being faithful. Here I am being consistent. Here I am being persistent. Maybe if I just wait this out, something will happen. And I kid you not. One more hour passed of that. And still, nothing happened. But now I was just, I had it. And I began to get discouraged. I even got a little embarrassed in front of the Lord. I thought, maybe it was, maybe I shouldn't have said that I'll stay here until until I starve or die. Because what if I do? And now, I began to analyze. That's, that for me, I have a tendency to analyze. That's what I always fall back on. I said, okay, maybe that's why God put that in me. And so I began to analyze and assess and plan and plot and reason. And I began to go through all the various scenarios. I thought, man, I I remember, I I started to remember all of the books I had read, all of the sermons I had heard, all of the the seminars I had attended. And I began to try to apply with reason. I'm going to be honest with you. If it were possible to enter the presence of God by human effort at that moment, I would have been in. Intellect failed. Willpower failed. Aggression failed. Emotion failed. Emotion is a good indication of your thought life but it fails. Willpower is commendable, but it failed. Intellect is useful, but it fails. Love never fails. And I remember I was crying. I had tears just streaming down my face. And I said, I can't find you. I don't know how to get in. I've done everything I can, Lord. And then I remember, in in a very good way, I gave up. I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know how to pray. Teach me how to pray. Show me what to do. What should my posture be? What exact words should I speak? What emotion should I be feeling? What physical uh, sensation should I have? And the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance, be still and know that I am God. There is no man or woman on earth, I don't care how anointed they are, there is no man or woman on earth who knows the way into the presence of God. Only the Holy Spirit knows the way into the presence of God. And if you will quiet yourself to listen, He will gently tell the way. I said, Lord, 
I give up. You have to show me now. And I remember I became very still. That scripture, be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. King David said, in quietness does he lead me. The first and the only entryway into true prayer is the gateway of silence and stillness. I know this is counterintuitive because human, human, the human will, the human intellect wants to try to find its way in. But silence is very practical. Jesus said when you pray, go, go aside by yourself. Go into your room, shut the door, lock it, and, and find that privacy because private prayer is revealed in public power. There's no public power on some believers' lives because there's no private prayer. They want to pray last minute before they minister and expect the move of the Holy Ghost. And I'm not here to, I'm not here to tear you down. I'm here to wake you up. Okay? The silence is very practical. Jesus said, just go and, 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 and shut everything off. That means turn your cell phone off. Shut the computer down. Stop watching TV. Just turn it off for an hour. Jesus said, could you not pray with me but for one hour? Put away the distraction. Put away the noise. Silence takes discipline. Silence takes um, your will. It takes action. And it's the easy part. Silence is the putting away of outer distraction. But stillness is the quieting of the soul. Now that is the hard part. Because when you go to pray, isn't it amazing that the first thoughts that come to your mind aren't positive ones. Isn't it interesting that all day you go without stressing, but the moment you get on your knees, bow your head, close your eyes, or whatever it is that you do to pray, guilt enters, anger enters, frustration enters. You start to think of all the relationship issues that you're having. You begin to think of all the financial trouble that you're having. You begin to think of all the responsibilities that you have to tend to throughout the rest of the day. And you wonder if perhaps you might need to cut your prayer time short. But see, it's not that those issues, those internal issues arise when we begin to pray. It's that they're revealed when we begin to pray. Those issues are always like that within you. When you go and find your stillness of prayer, that's a good measure of what the chaos is like inside of your life. Because if, you, if when you go to pray, there is this chaos, there is this clutter, there is this clamor, then that is always there. You're just never quiet enough to hear it. This generation has a shrinking attention span. This generation needs constant entertainment, constant, the constant switching of images before the eyes. We need change. We want everything customized. In an age where almost everything is customized, how do you connect with a God who never changes? In an age where everything is fast-paced and entertaining, how do you steal yourself? Everything is convenient. We've learned that if it takes too long, we're out of here. I'm leaving. You go to the drive-thru, and if they make you pull to the side, you throw a fit. <laughs> Two minutes pass. They never take this long. We want our food fast. We want our money fast. We want our entertainment fast. We want our gratification fast. And we want God given to us in the same way. Be still. And know your troubles. And know your responsibilities. And know the things to which you must tend. No, be still and know that I am God. Stillness precedes revelation. If you want to know, you have to be still. If you want God to be revealed, you have to be quiet. We worry, we assess, we analyze. Worry is just a useless attempt at control. Because we think that if we can think about it enough, that'll somehow change the circumstance. We need to give it to God. And so these are the four realms of prayer, and it starts with requesting. Number one, requesting. And there's a very good reason as to why Jesus begins with requesting. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says, Don't worry about anything. It gives us a better alternative. Instead, pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He has done. Stop there at verse 6. So instead of constantly worrying, whenever your mind goes to worry, that's a good opportunity to pray. And then Jesus says, tell God what you need and then thank Him for what He has done. It's possible to ask God for more and still be thankful. Being thankful is not settling. Gratitude really is, as the cliche says, an attitude. But you can ask God for more while still having a heart of gratitude. It says it right there. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Now this is powerful, verse 7. This is so powerful. Because we quote that scripture. I have a peace that passes all understanding. Right? It's right here. Verse 7. Then. When? Then. Then you will experience God's peace. When though? When do we experience God's peace? When we've made our request known to God. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. God wants you to ask. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, you'll receive. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Children ask and receive. The mature have to go seek it and find it. And those who are in close fellowship with God can knock and have the door fellowship open to them. It's a progression of spiritual growth. Ask, seek, knock. I'll ask him. If he doesn't seem to be responding, I'll go see where he is. And if I see that he's at home, I'm going to go knock on his door. I'm going to be persistent in prayer. I'm going to be persistent to ask for those things that I need. Now, this is interesting because the peace comes after you've made your request. God knows that we're frail. God knows that we're human. God knows that we're formed from the dust. He knows that and understands our humanity. Really, if God could have his way, he would have you praying 24-7 because he wants to spend that much time with you. When we approach the throne, sometimes we go hesitantly and we're wondering, God, is this okay? Am I cool to be here? And the reality is, is God wants to be in your presence more than you want to be in his But when we go to pray, we enter through the gate of requesting. We unburden ourselves before God. God, here is all that I'm dealing with. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. We say, well, I don't want to pray for a job promotion, especially when I know that there's some starving kid in Africa. Now, let me tell you something. It is tragic that there are starving people in this world. It is tragic that there is poverty all around the world. But God does not have to keep them down to raise you up. God does not have to keep another down to bring you up. It's not as if to bless someone, God has to curse someone else. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. He's eternally supplied. We have this martyr mentality. Oh, no, Lord, I, I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead and bless somebody else. I'm sorry. Did you die on the cross? That's not, that's not being merciful. That's having a poverty mindset. I love you. I love you. But the reality is, is that God wants to bless you financially so you can go and do something about those starving people, so that you can go and go over to those nations, so that you can sow into missions. So it's not wrong to ask. It gets a bad rap. And I'll tell you why it gets a bad rap. You hear it in preaching often. Don't just ask God for things. Stop asking him. He's done enough. Have we heard that? I've been guilty of preaching it myself. But here's where it gets its bad rap. It's because that's the gateway to prayer. You come, you unburden yourself. Now you can be still. Now you can be quiet. Now you can be calm. But some of us, we go, we unburden ourselves, we feel better, we go, ah, it feels great, see you later. You knock on the door, he opens it, you stand in the doorway, feel good, turn and walk away. That's when this form of prayer becomes wrong, is when it's all we do. But this requesting is given to us so that we can go to God and say, God, here are my needs. God takes those needs God says, I'm going to prioritize now. As long as you obey me, I will make sure this gets taken care of. You obey, you work, you, you, you do what the Word of God says, and leave the rest to God. So now you're 
still. And then the Holy Spirit might lead you, and this is in no particular order, the Holy Spirit might lead you into the second realm of prayer, which is reverencing or worship. All worship is a response to a revelation of God. Worship cannot be mandated. This is why the scripture says in John chapter 4, verse 23, but the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. Why is it only by the Spirit? Because revelation can only come by the Holy Spirit, and worship can only come by revelation. So the Holy Spirit inspires you to worship in that He creates before the eyes of your heart the very image of the Son of God. God the Father is too vast for comprehension. It would be easier for me to pick an ant up off the floor and explain to him how an iPad works than it would be for me to explain to you how God works. It's easier for an insect to understand computers than it is for you to understand God. But the Holy Spirit took God incomprehensible and by His power took God the divine and made Him Christ the man. That's power. The Father is incomprehensible. He's too difficult to explain. Jesus is the explanation of the Father. The Spirit is the application of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit, He fleshes out the Son. I don't mean as in sin nature. I mean in physical form or in a way that we can understand or relate with. The Holy Spirit takes the Son, the Word. The Bible says, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we see the Holy Spirit at work in John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intensifies the reality of Christ. So there I was in my room. Four hours had passed. And I was crying. And I said, Jesus, I just, I don't know what to do. You have to teach me to pray. And I had my Bible open. I had my worship music on. I had my light on so I can see the Bible. And I had the fan spinning so that it wouldn't get too hot, so that I wouldn't become distracted. And the Holy Spirit spoke very gently because he is a gentleman. He's classy. The Spirit doesn't make you senseless and silly. He makes you sharp. And he said, some of you will see this as heresy, but this is what he told me. He said, close the Bible. I closed the Bible. He said, turn off the light. I turned off the light. Switch off the fan. I switched off the fan. He said, turn off the music. I said, but you can't move without the music. I, I literally hesitated. That's, that's how programmed I was. I said, switch off the music. I switched off the music. He said, just wait and expect. In essence, he was telling me to be still and have faith. That's what it is. So if expecting could be a verb or an action, then that's all I did. I just expected. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. David said, in quietness does he lead me. So I stood there, I closed my eyes, and I remember there was this silence, this calm that had entered around the room. And I was just expecting, I was waiting, and anticipating God to do something. But there was that inner turmoil inside of me, still going, that all the thoughts, the analysis, everything. And the Holy Spirit said, look at me. And immediately I knew what he meant by that. He meant, look at Jesus. Look to the Word. And everything I had ever learned in this Scripture up to that point, everything that I had known of Jesus, that I had read of Jesus, all that I had read in the Bible, I began to visualize. I began to meditate on Jesus. You know, worldly meditation is emptying your mind. Godly meditation is filling your mind with the Word. So I began to fill my mind with the Word. 
And I began to see the image of Jesus. I don't, I'm not saying he came in physical form. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying that the Son of God became an intense and vivid reality in my room. I remember the moment I looked to Jesus, I, I, I was almost a gasp. And I was struck with awe. And I had my eyes closed. The tears were now beginning to dry up on my face. My hand was lifted. This was the fourth, past the fourth hour now. And when I looked to Jesus, I saw that glory. And in my heart, I was inspired to respond with accolades and adoration and praise and compliments. I said, whoa, you're just beautiful. And that's true worship. The Holy Spirit revealed Jesus because of the Word. The Holy Spirit in Genesis took the Word of God and formed on the void. The Holy Spirit takes the Word and fleshes out the Son. The Holy Spirit takes the Word and creates. That's why when you read the Word, as I'm going to get on my next point, Christ becomes incarnate in you. And I remember in that moment, I felt this gentle breeze, not physical, but it was like this wind that began to blow through my room. And I felt this cloud of warmth begin to descend on my body. My body started shaking and trembling. I began to cry, but these weren't tears of frustration anymore. It was like I had, I had, I had been digging all day trying to get through the well, and now the springs of living water were flowing right through my room. And my room did become a little piece of heaven on earth. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. And I felt the trembling. I felt the awe. It was so vivid, it was terrifying. He was altogether marvelous and altogether terrifying. And I began to tremble in my room. And I remember there was that holy fear and reverence that came over me. And I said, this is the glory of God. This is the glory of God. And I just began to become lost in worship, enamored with the image of Jesus. And I was so still. I was so quiet. I was so calm. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to disturb that moment. But I thought with my eyes closed that if I, if I moved my hand, I might feel it brush against his robe. I thought that in that moment, if I were to open my eyes, I might see Jesus standing there looking right back at me. I imagined his eyes filled with power and love. The authority of heaven resting on his shoulders. The power of the Holy Spirit surging like electricity through his hands. The wisdom I would hear on his voice. Church, that moment was worth four hours. It lasted for a couple minutes, and I'm not telling you that you will always experience that. What I am trying to say is that whatever you ever will, experience of God is by the Holy Spirit. That's worship. Worship cannot be mandated. I've seen worship leaders yell at people, get angry at people, tell them to lift their hands and sing. But even if they lifted their hands and sang, they wouldn't be worshiping. Worship is inspired, not mandated. You look around, you open your eyes, you see people just kind of standing there. They're on their phones. They're just staring blankly. Looks like nobody's home. You say, it doesn't look like they get it. I'm telling you, they don't. And they don't get it because the Holy Spirit didn't give it. And the Holy Spirit didn't give it because they didn't seek it. And they didn't seek it because they weren't still enough to know that they needed it. Number one, requesting. Number two, reverencing. Number three, resisting. This is spiritual warfare. I used to attend these prayer classes every Tuesday night. My aunt, I call her Aunt Nunu, she taught these prayer classes every Tuesday night. It was funny because I went to dinner with um, my parents and Ruben, our camera guy here. And we were there, and I remember I was sitting, we just went to Norm's because, you know, it was open. <laughs> For no other reason than that it was open. And I remember, I said, Dad, I remember sitting in that booth across over there, and I would sit in that booth every Tuesday night. My aunt would drive all the way to come pick me up from where I lived. I didn't drive then. She would take me to Huntington Park to teach her prayer class. 
I remember just being so, th- I was thrilled. I mean, we would go, I would just, for hours, I would sit and listen of spiritual warfare and breaking bondages and generational curses. And I would listen. And then every Tuesday night, she would drive me. And on the way home, my aunt would stop by Norm's. And she'd buy me a sandwich, and we'd talk about what I had just learned in the class. And that, that was for almost a year she did that, almost every Tuesday. And that formed my foundation, my understanding of prayer and spiritual warfare. And so spiritual warfare is resisting. You can't fight the enemy on your own. The enemy has been around for hundreds of and even thousands of years, and he understands human nature. He understands the intricacies. Demons are spiritually lethal assassins. They're trained to take you out. The key to overcoming demonic powers isn't engaging them, this is what I learned, but resisting their authority by the authority of God. Resist the devil, and he will not engage him, not yell at him, though that's part of it, Sometimes it feels good, but we resist the devil, and the spiritual warfare goes beyond this. We can pray for several things. We can pray for others' salvation, Romans 10.1. We can pray for the safety of others, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. We can pray for cities, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. We can pray for the strengthening of others' faith, Luke 22.32. We can pray for authority figures, 1 Timothy 2.2-3. 2, 2 we can pray for the blessings of a nation, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And we can pray for miracles, Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 12. Those are just some, I mean, I could go on listing, but it's like a tongue twister. But there are so many things that we can grab a hold of in prayer and we resist. You really think that it's just marriage problems? Do you really think that it's just the drugs in your children? Do you really think that it's just a bad season for your business or ministry? Or is it possible that there is demonic warfare at play and you need to get a hold of God and drive out those demons? I find it interesting that when talking about financial blessing, the scripture uses the terminology of rebuking the devourer. Some of you, for your ministries, for your churches, let me tell you something. The enemy is so, and, and, and it's funny that we know the cliche that the devil's greatest lie or ever, his most um, successful lie is convincing the people that he doesn't exist, right? We know it. We've heard it. But isn't it amazing how we still fall for it? That we think that it really just is an emotional issue? That we think that it really is just a sense of failure? That we think that it really is just a disconnect that we feel from our brothers and sisters? That we think it really is just our own frustration? A lot of this is spiritual, and I pray that God would open my eyes and your eyes to see all of the assaults of the enemy. Because the other cliche is also true, that a devil exposed is a devil defeated. Resisting. Finally, number four, reading the Spirit and the Word. Number one, requesting. Number two, reverencing. Number three, resisting. And number four, it's reading. Reading your Bible is a form of prayer. I don't want to take too much more time. Um, I'll take another two minutes to, to do this, and then we're going we're gonna to believe God for a move of the Holy Spirit in this place. Do you believe that? I do. I really believe that this morning the Holy Spirit can move. So the Spirit and the Word. Jesus talked about in John chapter 6, and I'm going to have to paraphrase this because it's a, it's, it would be an extended teaching on this, but we'll give you the meat of it. John chapter 6, Jesus talks about several things. Remember that chapter where he talks about how you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood and it freaked everybody out? Okay, well, what he was talking about there was the process by which he was translated and set at the right hand of the Father. He starts by saying the bread of heaven has come down. That's incarnation. And then he goes on to say that that bread of heaven, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. He was not talking about cannibalism for later in that chapter. The scripture says that the flesh accomplishes nothing. So it's not cannibalism. It's not transubstantiation. It is the crucifixion of Jesus. Number one is incarnation. Number two is crucifixion. And then he starts to say, oh, does that trip you out? Because they're like, Lord, this is hard for us to handle. He says, oh, does that trip you out? Well, what would you think of this then? 
He says, okay, so there's incarnation, there's crucifixion. He talks about his resurrection next couple verses. Then he says, what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascending? His ascension. Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. And then he takes this sudden turn. Go to John chapter 6. This is, this amazed me when I saw it, and I didn't get it. I had to hear commentaries, and, and again, by no means is this an original thought. This, is, this teaching has been around for, uh, I think, since the early church when they understood what he meant. John chapter 6, verse 62, we'll start there. So again, he talks about the bread of life coming down, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. And then look in verse 62, you'll see the ascension, uh, ascension again. Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven? Then suddenly there's this, this turn, this twist. He says the Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And what does he say? The very words I have spoken to you are, the very words I have spoken to you are, Spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. Now why would he go from talking about his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension to suddenly switching and saying the Spirit alone gives life. Well, the Bible says that Adam became a living soul, but Christ is a life-giving Spirit. Now, here in the United States, we use a lot of superlatives. Now, this is the best. This is the most amazing. You know, and we have experiences with God and we can't really have any, find any words that are useful to describe it because we wasted the word awesome on a sandwich or something. <laughs> right, so that when God moves, how was service? Oh, it was awesome. Like, like, oh, like that sandwich the other day. You know, we, we, you, we throw out superlatives and compliments and words and they lose their value because we throw them out so much. But I really am amazed at technology. And I think it serves as a good analogy here. My, my nephew is somewhere around here in this building. And I have all these pictures of him on my phone. I mean, I literally ran out of space taking pictures of him. And I'm a sentimental person. If I lost my phone and lost that, those pictures, I'd be, I'd be pretty sad. And this has my calendar, my contacts, my notes. I have literally thousands of notes. I write on average, I think it was three to four hours a week. I'm just writing, writing, writing. I tried to anyway. But if I were to lose this phone, all that data would be gone. But there's this technology I have on my phone. When I store it in the internet, it's called putting it on the cloud. Jesus ascended on a cloud. He said, I have to go, and the Spirit alone gives life. The Holy Spirit is Jesus on the cloud. And you have access to him from anywhere, at any time, by any means, that can never be destroyed. And when you read the word, prayer doesn't become an upload. It becomes a download. For the word again becomes alive in you. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? <laughs>